Hey everyone, this is Bathmetrics, and in this video we're going to do part six of my little mini-series on audio editing in the newest Bitwig 3.2. Um, this is the final video of this mini-series, and we're going to focus on one of the hardest things to deal with in audio editing and stretching, which is acapellas. Acapellas are notoriously hard and difficult to work with, so I'm going to teach you some tricks for thinking about how to grab an acapella and get it stretched correctly, think about the best ways to uh, adjust it, so on and so forth. So if you haven't seen the earlier videos in this little mini series, I highly recommend you at least go back and watch the very first episode one where I talk about a lot of big picture stuff. And really you should watch the whole thing because we're gonna draw upon a lot of different things we've talked about with regard to audio editing as we work with acapellas. Um, so if you don't go back and watch at least some of the first few videos in the series, you may be a little lost at me jumping around and just doing things because I assume I've already showed you how to do them. Um, so there we go. And another thing I should point out, I haven't really pointed it out yet, but I do have a, a handbook out here that I wrote for myself once upon a time when I was first learning Bitwig, uh, I wrote it just for myself as a way of keeping notes about stuff I learned and techniques I figured out. And uh, I eventually shared it with everyone. And um, I keep it updated with new stuff that I learn. You can see there's a bunch of people in here reading it right now, but I'm gonna put a link to this in the description for the video and in the links to the descriptions for all the videos in the series. And I just want you to be aware that down a little ways under audio clip and event editing. Uh, I've got a bunch of notes that pretty much summarize everything I've talked about in all the videos so far. And right down here at the bottom is another section about tips for working with acapellas. So uh, we'll also kind of summarize the things I'm gonna show you in this video and demonstrate in this video. So you can go back there and refer to this after these videos and should jog your memory about stuff. So let's talk about why acapellas are so difficult to work with. If you drag in any old random drum loop, like this little short drum loop, and you know, as I've showed you in other videos, Bitwig will pretty much automatically warp this. Once you, if it's got BPM information in the metadata and you come over here and turn on a warping mode like Elastic Pro, Bitwig's automatically going to line up things to the grid. It already knows how to warp it. So the original pitch was slower at 100 BPM than my current project at 110, so it made the, the clip shorter as part of stretching it. So now it's exactly, if I drag this in, it's exactly a two-bar drum clip and all the drum beats are lined up. But let's say for whatever reason that um, you didn't know that and the metadata wasn't in the clip. It didn't have its BPM in the clip name. And so, you know, let's pretend we brought it in and Bitwig didn't know what to do with it. And so when you, when you turned a stretching mode on, Bitwig just left it at the tempo of the project when you first dragged it in. So you can look at this clip and you can see none of the beats are, are lining up on the grid. But because it's a typical drum beat with very loud, sharp, percussive elements, it's pretty easy to tell what you have to do. I mean, you can tell that these beats are getting slightly longer all throughout. And probably what I need to do is move the clip inward this way. And you could do it um, by going into like audio event mode. And let's uh, focus the whole clip in here. I could come in here and use the tricks I showed you where you could just hold down shift and slide it in until it looks like everything's lining up on the grid like that, right? And you can see over here, it looks kind of like they're lining up, but over here it's too far inward. So we're gonna go back in this direction and you just kind of eyeball it until everything lines up across the entire length of the clip. And sure enough, we can see it's really close to a hundred. And so we can just double click this and make it a hundred. And now this clip is perfectly lined up, right? Another way to do it, if we, and this is an easier way to do it sometimes than using the stretch gesture over here, sometimes it's easier to just grab the tempo control and click it and hold down shift so that you're going by one increment at a time. And you can just drag this thing up or down in the tempo until it looks like everything's lined up 
correctly, like about there. And sure enough, we're back on 100. I wasn't even looking at this. I was just lining these things up with the grid, right? So drum loops and highly percussive things with very obvious beat, rhythmic beat patterns baked into the waveform are super easy to like just eyeball, especially if you've ever uh, DJed and worked with DJ software and you're really just, you've kind of grown really comfortable looking at a waveform and seeing the beats in the waveform and understanding how the beats line up against the grid and whether they're drifting against the grid and they're, it's going too slow compared to the grid or too fast compared to the grid. DJs have an easy time with this. But acapellas are still somewhat mysterious and confusing because the beat structure, the rhythmic structure to vocals isn't nearly as obvious when you just look at this. It's like, where are the beats in these vocals? Right? It's not, it's not visually as obvious by any stretch. And this is compounded by the fact that good singers purposely, it's not just that they sing in a humanized way that isn't perfect and precise, but they will purposely play games with timing. They will rush certain beats, strong beats in a, in a, in a rhythm. They'll rush against the, the beats or they'll drag against the beats. They'll draw certain syllables out, then they'll speed up and rush a few things. And it's only a few syllables in every one bar phrase that tend to actually land on the beat, right? And reinforce the beat. Like you could have an entire one bar phrase, like this phrase down here is in the span of one bar. And it's possible that like literally only two of the, of the blobs on here are actually hitting on the beat. And every other blob you see here is probably rushed ahead or pulled behind the beat, right? And the same with this one bar phrase over here and so on. So vocals can be really challenging unless you know a few tricks. And I'm gonna show you those tricks. There's a really easy, simple process for looking at some acapella stems like these two, these are stems. Uh, with nothing but vocals on them. I'm going to show you the easy way to figure these out, get them lined up on the grid, even if there's like zero information in the sample name that tells you what the original tempo was, okay? That's what I'm going to spend most of this video doing, is teaching you that those two or three tricks you need to know how to do this. There's a process that's very fast and easy, and I'm borrowing it from the way DJs work. Okay, but first, let's look at an acapella that might actually have some tempo information. Okay, so here's an acapella. That's a little fast for my project tempo. Let's find something closer to the project tempo. 110, that's on the tempo. I'm looking for something around 120, 130, 140. Mary, I know you're hiding here. Okay, well, we'll just grab a 150 tempo thing. So let's drag this little short acapella fragment in. So again, it's a stem. There's lots of space in here. There were just vocals over a few parts. And because there's tempo information already in the clip, Bitwig will know exactly what to do with this the minute I come over here and turn on a stretch mode like Elastic Pro. And boom, you can see instantly the phrases are now lining up against the grid. And there's an eight bar intro that didn't have any vocals. And then at the downbeat of bar nine, we start with some vocal phrases. And you know, here's basically probably a verse or maybe a chorus or something. This might be a breakdown uh, or you know, pre-drop. And then remember we turned on warping mode, so we probably have to look under the clip to see how far this goes now, right? So the clip comes all the way out to here. Here's another probably a chorusy thing, who knows, right? So we don't really know what the original structure of the song was that the sock capella was made in, but we can clearly see that it was recorded at a tempo of 150 because a lot of these events, these phrases, are starting right on a downbeat. Like this phrase here starts right after the downbeat. This one starts right on the downbeat and so on. And then these are sort of accented in the middle of each of these respective well, they're actually on downbeats too, because my grid resolution's out here. That's on a downbeat, that's on a downbeat, and so on. So, of course, it's very nice <laughs> and easy to do the hardest part 
of getting your, your stems lined up, which is figuring out what their actual true tempo is, making sure that you've found where they should start um, to match uh, the downbeats and backbeats of the song. But it's a lot harder when you don't have any tempo information and you can't make sense of this waveform to figure out what you're seeing. So that's what I'm going to show you. So I'm going to show you how to do this the hard way. Uh, there's a, well, I'm going to do the hard way first and then I'll show you one possible shortcut that some of you might be able to take advantage of. But I'm going to show you just how to brute force it right in Bitwig itself without any special tools or anything. We're just going to do it the old school way like a DJ would. So let's start with this or, uh, this yellow colored clip. The number one step is you have to learn to visually identify where the phrases and sections of the song that this acapella was recorded against. Where are those phrases and sections? Where do they start? What's the, what's the implied structure of this song? So... <clears throat> We're looking at the yellow clip here, and we, we've got a slightly more detailed view down here. Bar one through bar eight is the first thing my eyeballs are drawn to because in almost all popular music, electronic dance music, anything, you know, any kind of acapella track you, you purchase, acapella pack that you purchase, is probably going to be recorded in an EDM electronic dance genre or a pop genre of some sort. And everything in those genres is pretty much built around the rule of eights. Everything is broken into eight bar sections, right? Multiples of two, four, and eight. Everything happens on eights and its subdivisions of multiples. You have eight bar sections, you have 16 bar sections, you might have four bar sections or 12 bar sections. It's always, you know, those kinds of multiples. And DJs know this because, um, you know, DJs just know how to count without even thinking about it in terms of eight. One, you know, there's the first bar, second bar, third bar, fourth bar. Okay, now I'm coming up on five, six, seven, eight, and then something new is going to happen after eight, right? And you just know that every eight bars, something's going to change, right, as a DJ. And you know how to look at a waveform and just you, your eyes picking out what does it look like every eight bars. That's going to tell me a lot about the structure of a song. So what I expect to see here is if this were at the right tempo and stretched correctly, you know, to my current project tempo, if we get the stretching right, this is a phrase, this is clearly a phrase because it's a bunch of vocals and then there's a big pause. And then there's another chunk of vocals and a pause. So these are clearly two phrases, probably the first two verses of the original song. And because these are currently sitting at about six bars each in their length, I'm going to guess these are originally meant to be eight bar phrases. Okay? And so the beginning of this waveform right here probably wants to fall right on the nine so that this first chunk fits in the first eight bars, and then this second chunk is going to fit in the next eight bars, from nine all the way up through the end of 15. So right there, I have a really strong visual clue that these are probably eight bar sections, and we're going to test that theory right now, very simply. So the first thing I'm going to do is make a little room to stretch this waveform out. I'm going to just grab the edge of the clip, drag it out, make room for the audio event itself, to expand in this direction as I stretch it. And I could stretch it this way, but I'm gonna just use tempo and go up exactly one BPM at a time and watch what happens. I'm gonna start at 110, click it, hold down my shift key so I'm working in fine increments and I'm gonna to go to 111, 112, 13, 14, 15, 16, and so on. And I'm gonna keep stretching until that lines up right on the nine, that beat right there. Now, I'm close. I can see that this is close to working, but there's a few things still wrong to my eyeballs here. Um, as we keep moving forward, looking down here, we can see that every new little chunk of vocals keeps pulling inward this side of the grid, the grid line they're closest to by a little more each and every time, right? So clearly we haven't pushed it out far enough yet. And another clue 
for my eyes. We're going to zoom in here a little bit. Another clue is that there's a little bit of a um, empty space at the start of this phrase. There's one, basically one beat. So one and one and two, one and two and three and four and one and two and three and four and right. These are quarter note chunks here. So this is kick, snare, kick, snare, downbeat, backbeat, downbeat, backbeat, and so on. So I can see that this vocal phrase doesn't start right on the downbeat. It actually starts on the next strong beat of the bar, because kicks and snares, one, two, three, four, those are all strong beats. And then there's the off beats in the middle of the strong beats, right? And the first strong beat, the 1.1, one one, is the downbeat, the kick. 1.2 is a backbeat for the first snare. 1.3 is a downbeat again for the second kick, and 1.4 is the down, the backbeat for this, the second snare. And then we start all over again with the next bar. So we've got a phrase that skips the first, you know, it lets the drum and whatever the first little sounds of that bar, it lets it happen, and then the phrase starts on the first snare, on the first backbeat. So chances are good, if this is the pattern that they used for the first eight-bar phrase, with this little pause after the downbeat before they start singing, which is common, right? Chances are good we're going to want to see the same pattern over here in this second phrase. So really, this first part of the second phrase won't start exactly on the nine. It probably wants to start right here on the first backbeat of the nine. So Zooming in a little closer so we can see this part carefully right here. I'm just going to keep going upward with my tempo. A few more clicks until I get that thing right sitting over the line right there like that. And now I can see I've set a tempo of 140 for the original tempo. I'm guessing right now based on my visual stretching like a DJ would do that this entire acapella is probably at 140. So now we're going to test that theory. We're going to look at the whole waveform a little more closely. And we can see these two phrases look very symmetrical, right? A little bit of a gap, a one beat gap at the beginning there, a one beat gap at the beginning there. They're both ending shortly after this um, point in each eight bar phrase. Let's zoom in a little bit this way. Right, so they're, they're ending right after the sixth bar. There's a little tail right after the sixth bar. There's a slightly longer tail, but it's basically just a tail. And then there's this nice gap for music to happen before the next verse starts. And then we get into a different part of the song where clearly the cadence and verses are different. This is probably now getting into the choruses or maybe the pre-choruses, maybe a drop. It just depends on what the original song was. But again, we can see a very symmetrical structure. Every two bars, pretty much right on the downbeat, or just, um, yeah, pretty much just like there's a little lead in going into the first uh, backbeat again. They start with a little bit of phrasing up front and then emphasize here. But it's the same symmetrical pattern, the same kind of gaps and spacing and length falling nicely in these two bar chunks, right? All the way through here. And then there's a little difference here. There's a little more of a pause and they start this phrase here. But everything's looking very symmetrical. So I'm going to guess this is truly at an original BPM of 140. Now the thing is, how do we test this? How do we make sure that it really is at 140? So here's trick number two. You don't use a metronome click. The metronome will lie to you because a vocal phrase always has a certain groove to it that matches the interplay and the feel of the downbeats and backbeats of the song. So let me let me take a little side trip as a drummer, as a musician. This is one of the things drummers learn really early, and I, I spent six years on stage as a drummer. Before that, I was a bass player for a very long time. Um, Downbeats and backbeats are everything. The kick and the snare, the feel of the where the kick hits, 
how you're doing some syncopation around the downbeats, how you're hitting the backbeats like a, like a clock, like a metronome, but maybe playing with the kicks around that and letting them be loose and syncopated or vice versa. Maybe, maybe some of the kicks, like the first downbeat is really tight and right on the beat, but the, the second downbeat of the bar, the number three beat of the bar, might be a little loose or might have an extra syncopation around it. And then the snares might be lazy, they might push, they might pull against the beat. There's this whole interplay between downbeat and backbeat that a drummer uses to create the sense of feel and groove for a given song. And singers play off the drums. Singers lock all their phrasing and their flow to what the drums are doing. And whether a singer realizes it consciously or not, their vocal force often plays to reinforce and accent some of the downbeats, right? When a singer goes, da 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 Da, da, right? All those louder little exhalations, unconsciously, almost always, will be locking them with the kick drum, okay? Now, some singers will flip it around, and they'll actually do those, those slight accented, louder, breathy things. They'll do it on the snares, on the backbeats. It really kind of depends on the song, and it kind of depends on the vocal line they're doing, but the, the common and somewhat subconscious thing to do is to be emphasizing the downbeats of a given bar. Um, so usually if you're looking at a vocal waveform, all of these blips that are slightly bigger and obviously more impactful, like they put more breath into it, a lot of times those are gonna be falling on the kick. So the start of each bar or the middle of each bar in a common time song or in a slower, uh, a song that uses a halftime drum feel like dubstep, right? It's 140 BPM, but the kick and snare are halftime. So the kick happens on the one, the snare happens on the three, then the kick happens on the one again, and the snare happens on the three. It's like exactly half speed compared to what the grid's doing, what the, what the, the tempo of all the other instruments is doing. It's called a halftime feel. That's what makes dubstep have its unique push and pull feel um, and feel kind of slow, even though other elements like hats and LFOs and all that stuff might be zipping along at a 16th note grid at 140 BPM, right? But the kick and snare feel really slow and heavy and laggy against that. So most vocals, especially if it's sort of pop-oriented vocals or future bass or hip-hop or anything like that, they're going to be rolling around at a common time feel where the kick is on the one and the three and the snare is on the two and the four of each bar. And you're often going to see the bigger blurbs reinforcing the kick. So look at what we got here in, in bar one. Kick, snare, kick, snare, and then back to bar two with kick, snare, kick, snare. And look where the biggest hit on this entire waveform is in this first bar. It's right on the three. It's right on a kick. It's on the second downbeat of the bar. Same here. They're a little quiet through here, but one of the bigger looking waveforms is on the downbeat here. Uh, if we look over here, there's nothing happening on the downbeat. They, they're waiting into the phrase to start in. But again, this big blob is right on the downbeat on, on the second kick and so on and so forth. And then over here, we start seeing them kind of evenly stress the kick. Um, they're doing a really fast riff here, but still one of the bigger parts is on the kick and then they're emphasizing the snare. And then here they're kind of all over the map. So I don't know what's happening with this phrase, but just visually I'm getting clues that they're, they're probably locking to the kick. And this is probably the right timing for the phrase, but now we're gonna test this. So the thing is, if we run it against a metronome, it's gonna sound good. It's gonna sound like it's on beat, but we don't really know that it's on beat yet. Check it so out. He's got that Turn one off. Think fast, my heart rate starts to rise. Stand still, my mind getting paralyzed. So much, I just can't take it in. 
watch this one. Old news, and now I'm feeling new vibes. Fresh air. Okay, so in this one, she's she's using all the strong beats, and she's just picking her own rhythm against the snare and the kick, you know? Boom, da, da. Downbeat. Kaboom, da, da. Da, 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 da. Da, boom, da, da. Do da 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 da. Right. Okay. So she's just made up her own rhythm for this, and she's not particularly emphasizing the strong beats. She she's she's using both the downbeat and the backbeat, and that's cool. They're they're going to do that sometimes, but you'll find in a lot, a lot of the time, the kick is your is your clue. But the real test, the metronome makes it sound like it's in tune. But here's a thing. Here's a problem. Here's a a trick. You'll notice both of these waveforms have a little bit of dead space before the singer starts. And you would hope that the engineer who cuts these stems cuts them so that they actually should start on the one of any given bar, wherever it may be in the song. Not necessarily right at the beginning of the song. There might be an eight bar or 16 bar intro before the singer ever starts singing, right? So this might really be like bar six, six, 17 of the song, right? But a lot of times when they're making a cappella packs, they'll just like, they'll go to the nearest bar in front of where the vocals start and they'll just chop it there and then they'll ship it in the pack. And you don't really know if this is truly going to be lined up on the one or the nine or the 17 or the 33, etc. of a song. You don't really know where this is going to fall. You can't always trust the engineer. And it's it's very useful and important to maybe think, should this actually start a beat later? Or should it even start here? Or should it start here, right? Where exactly should this start in relation to a full, um, a full bar? Could start anywhere in here, right? We don't really know where the one of this phrase is. It's very common for singers to do a pickup. Like, if the singer's starting this, this is a big blob, this is a big blob. So let's say this could be the downbeat of her bar. And so if I come over here and put this thing right about on the two, right, this could be a, a lead-in note, a breath or, or a short syllable leading into the syllable she's stressing for emphasis that might be hitting on the downbeat of the two. We don't know until we test this. And the way you test it is with a drum beat, not with a metronome. So let's turn off the metronome and let's show you my trick for this. I'm going to actually give you this clip. I have a special clip in my library that I call acapella analysis. And yeah, maybe I shouldn't give it to you because most of you aren't going to have EXO. No, I'm not going to give it to you. I'm, I'm so sorry. <laughs> it also uses Serato sample, which you may not have either. Um, this is a, I'll just show you what I did and you can reproduce this kind of thing in your own whatever. So first let's get Serato sample out of the way. Serato is there because uh, it's a very useful VST. I know some people don't have the budget for VSTs. I know some people are anti-VST, but this is such a workhorse VST. It's, it's the only thing in town that will let you do MPC style beat flipping of any kind of sample. So like if I have an acapella and I drag it in here, um, here's my acapella. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I can say, just find me a bunch of slices in this whole thing. I click a button and suddenly magically I have all these cue points in here. Just like in any DJ software, there's all these random cue points. And if I press any of these, I got to make it playable. Where's my song? Oh, I got to unmute it too. There we go. Tell me, can you see this? We're just running. Right? And you can come over here and you can like adjust them wherever you want them. Like, let's see what that oh, one sounds like. Oh, oh, oh. Yeah. yeah. So because it's an acapella, it's a little loosey-goosey where it's finding things. But the point is, you can come through here and you can have it randomly find samples for you. If there isn't a lot of dead space like an acapella stem has, it's usually going to land these on interesting places. Or you can just come in and manually adjust them and 
You can just make a, a 32 pad drum machine and play it with a drum pad type controller, like a push or whatever. And uh, you can do MPC style bit flipping. So this is useful just for that, right? And I, I recommend you, you have this kind of tool. It's very cheap. It's, it's only about 60 or $70, I think. But the other thing that makes this tool really useful is Serato is a pretty respected DJ software. And they're pretty respected for their pitch and time analysis of like long songs. Um, and they're pretty accurate. It's never perfect. It, it, it's actually tough to analyze the key of a song, especially if it's only an a cappella and there aren't a lot of other musical pitches and cues and beats and rhythms in the song for the analysis software to think about and chew on. But it's usually pretty accurate in terms of what it guesses the key to be and what it guesses the uh, tempo to be right here. So. In this case, it's a little bit off. The song is originally according to cymatics. This particular a cappella is the key of F sharp minor. Is that what I dragged in here? Yeah, F sharp minor. Now, Serato thinks it's in the key of E, but that's largely because it's an a cappella. A cappellas are really hard to analyze because it's just a melody, and a lot of times the singer will slide and bend their notes. And so it can be a little hard to figure out what is the actual key of the song, because there's not a lot of harmonic chord information. It's just one set of melodies all along the way. Sometimes it's a little off in the key signature or the, of, of the a cappella sample, but it's often really, really close for the BPM, even though there's like no beats or rhythmic information in here at all. It's just vocals, right? So Cymatics is telling us it's 128 BPM. Serato thinks it's 127.60, which is effectively 128, right? So it actually guessed the tempo of this really well. So what I'm getting at is I have Serato in this rack because if for some reason I have an old recording that I didn't, I stupidly didn't put my own tempo information into the sample title, and it was something I did a year ago, <laughs> And I have no idea what tempo it's at because it's just in my sample library. It's not in a project where I can see the original tempo. Um, if I have something like that or somebody gives me a stem that they got or somebody, you know, has some old a cappella that came from who knows where and they say, hey, check this out. And there's no BPM information in it. Sometimes you can save yourself a lot of time by just dropping it into Serato, seeing what Serato thinks the BPM is, and then starting with that and experimenting a little bit with there. So that's why I have Serato in this. We're going to ignore it for this. We're not going to use it for these. We're going to do it the hard way. The main other thing I use this for is um, there's a drum machine in here. And my favorite drum machine is XO, um, mainly because of the way that the browser works. It's, it's, my, it's a drum librarian. <laughs> That's amazing and does. Um, I did a whole. I've done a whole video on it, so I'm not going to go into it. But the point is, I use this, and I'm using it to play a kick, a snare, and a um, shaker. And these are pretty low-key, big, hollow sounds that leave room in the spectrum for vocals, so they're not going to overshadow the vocals very much. Right? These are all pitched pretty low and kind of spread out and long and washy in their tone. So they're not going to interfere with the vocals. And uh, it's just because I have XO, I just made my drum machine out of that. And then I have a little drum clip here that's just kick, snare, and shakers. And it's just an incredibly simple downbeat, backbeat, downbeat, backbeat with eighth note shaker patterns. Because this will help me feel where the singer is bouncing off of the interplay between downbeat and backbeat. Because the vocal lines sometimes will stress the downbeats, other vocal lines will stress the backbeats, other vocal lines will have syncopations in them that will fall onto some of these offbeat notes in between uh, the kick and the snare. And it just listening to the a cappella against a drum track gives you a lot more information about whether you're starting the a cappella at the right point. Because, again, acapellas tend to have um, lead-ins to their phrases. Like, this is a 
This is an eight bar phrase, but what I don't know is where the downbeat of the first part of the phrase is. It could be that this blip right here should be landing on a downbeat, and this is actually a lead in note, right? One, two, three, four. I got you, do, 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 whatever it might be, right? This could be a I lead in before the got you on the downbeat of the next bar, right? This could be the start of the phrase. And maybe the phrase ends there, right? Um, but we don't know until we start testing this against a drum beat. So this is what I'm going to do now. So I'm going to leave the stem sitting over here at beat one. There's a couple scenarios that are common with a cappellas. Let's look at it this way. A lot of times there will be a single one or two syllable type of quick and dirty lead-in note, either on the last beat of a bar or maybe even the last eighth note of a bar. And the first thing you see right after that is the actual downbeat that they're syncing up to with the song. Okay, this is a very common scenario right here, just like that. Especially since we have a big blip here, which usually is going to land on a downbeat. Now, another somewhat common scenario is that, um, you know, this might really be starting at something like after a f eight bar intro. They're going to have an eight bar intro with no vocals. And then right here, we're going to have a big downbeat to start a verse. And they're going to let that downbeat hit with like the kick and the other instruments around the downbeat. And the vocalist won't want to compete with that. So they'll just start their phrase, they'll give a little space after the downbeat, and then start their phrase and start going along from there, right? That's a very common trick too, we'll see. So this thing could be starting right at the start of the clip, and it's just like, this is all phrase, it picks up really quickly, and there's just a little gap or a pause after the first downbeat. Or it could be that this thing should be sitting like this. And this is the downbeat right here, this blob that's a little bigger than the other blobs. Now, we're not going to know any of this until we test it. And you can't really test it against a metronome because a metronome is just click, 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 click. And it doesn't help you feel the vocal emphasis. So check this out when we play it against a downbeat. I'm going to test this theory first. I'm going to guess this might be the, the downbeat of the bar. And this is a lead in before the first beat. and we're going to pretend that there's an eight bar intro and then the verse really starts here at bar nine with a little bit of a lead in. Let's see what this sounds like. And we're going to start it by going halfway in front of it and just really feel the drum beat by the time we get to this. Think fast, my heart rate starts to rise. Stand still, my mind getting paralyzed So much, I just can't take it in And then another pickup right here Old news, and now I'm feeling new vibes Fresh air, making this come alive Deep breath, I'm jumping off the high dive So that sounds like that could be where the bar actually starts. That felt very natural against the drum beat. Nothing seemed jarring, right? Let's do a trick. Let's push this out to here. And now let's see what it sounds like. And we'll just do a one bar lead in this time. So we had an intro of eight bars and we're gonna start the verse on the nine bars. And let's see what this feels like. Think fast, my heart rate starts to rise Stand still, my mind getting paralyzed So much, I just can't take it in Okay, that feels very natural too. So far, it could be either one of those choices. The singer might just be saying, okay, I'm going to start the phrase after the downbeat or... I'm going to start the phrase before the downbeat, and this thing fast, the fast is going to fall on the downbeat. Either one of those could work, and it works because in both cases, this is falling on a strong beat, right? When it's over here, this falls on the, the number one kick of a bar, 
And when it's sitting here, it falls on the number two kick of the bar, you know, at beat number three, kick, snare, kick, snare, right? So it feels natural in both positions. Now, just to show you how it can feel really wrong if we do it a different way, let's set things up so that this strong vocal accent is falling on the first snare of the bar at kick, snare, kick, snare on beat number two, the back beat. Watch how this is gonna sound weird. Think fast, my heart rate starts to rise. Stand still, my mind getting paralyzed. Feel how, feel how everything sounds wrong, right? So this is a, a clue. This is another tip to think about, uh, a conceptual thing to think about. Everything you see is probably gonna feel right either with a certain part of the vocal form hitting on every kick, every downbeat, or hitting on every backbeat, right? And you're not gonna know that until you test it, but what's usually almost always the case is it'll sound really good on one, but it'll sound terrible on the other. So listen to it again. We're gonna start it on a downbeat right here. Think fast, my heart rate starts to rise. Stand still, my mind getting paralyzed. And now we're just gonna slide it over one bar so that everything's the same things that were hitting on the downbeat before are now hitting on the backbeat with the snares. And watch how terrible this sounds. Think fast, my heart rate starts to rise. Stand still, my mind getting Okay, so really feel that. If it doesn't sound, if you don't hear what I'm talking about, practice until you start feeling it. Um, singers will have an easier time with this. Producers that have worked with a lot of singers will have an easier time with this. DJs will feel this almost intuitively, right? Um, you got to learn to hear what, what the vocals are trying to play along with, the downbeats or the backbeats. It's never both. It's never either or. So our, our we know that this blob here wants to fall on either the first downbeat of the bar or it wants to fall on the second downbeat of the bar. What we don't know yet is which one of those two choices is correct. So we're going to look at the waveform here, see if we can get a few clues. We're going to listen a little farther ahead. Uh, let's go back to our first, our first punch, which was this first big... Uh, accented louder part of the waveform is falling on the first downbeat of the bar and this is a lead in this is a pickup line right and what we're going to do is we're going to come over here we listen to these two phrases and they sound good either way but let's see what's going on here this might give us some clues which is which because you'll see here this waveform is starting on almost in the middle of the previous bar and that looks a little odd to me it would look a little more natural to see them starting on the downbeat of the bar like this. And you'll notice I just moved it two clicks over, two beats over. So <laughs> we're going to see which is which. Let me line this up again because I think I moved it one beat too far. Let's try this first and let's see if this sounds right over here. We're going to start right here. Can't find the words that I'm trying to say. See, this da 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 there's an emphasis on, on that fourth syllable. Da 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 And that makes me think this is the right position for the song. Because listen to it again. Can't find the words that I'm trying to say. Da 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 can't find the kick, snare, kick, snare, right? Feel how, how natural that sounds? Now, if I slide this whole thing over, it's still gonna sound right, kind of, but check it out. Can't find the words that I'm trying to say. It works, kind of, 
but the accents feel to me like they're in the wrong place because it's kind of constant da 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 da. And so we have this strong downbeat with nothing in the vocals reinforcing that downbeat. The first kick of the bar is always very important. And so there's this nothingness and then da 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 da. And the second downbeat is happening. Look where the second emphasized note is happening. Watch this really closely. Can't find the words that I'm trying to say. Um, can't find the words I'm trying to say. But that trina is not really strong like the words is. Listen. Can't find the words that I'm trying to say words I'm trying to say that to me that really feels like it wants to fall on the one and the three not on the three and then the one right let's try a couple more phrases and see what we do and this is really our clue right here listen to this Do, da, da. The, the strong kind of feel is somewhere here. So let's slide the thing back where it was. Two beats over this way. Let's listen to this one more time. Can't find the words that I'm trying to say. You let me speechless anyway. See how when we slide it two beats this way? So da da, so vulnerable, vulnerable. Listen to this part. And I feel so vulnerable. I really feel like, okay, this could be a either or decision on the producer's part, but to me, this cadence of the da da. Da, 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 feels a lot more natural on the first downbeat and second downbeat as the pattern. And this is a lead in. Can't find the words that I'm trying to say. You leave me speechless anyway. That feels very, very natural. But if I slide it back here. just doesn't feel quite as much like it's reinforcing the drum beat as this. Can't find the words that I'm trying to say. You let me speechless anyway. Okay. So you have to use subtle clues like that to see what's going on. With these two sections, I'm thinking this is currently the right offset for the song, which is considering this to be a lead-in, and this is the first beat of each verse, the strong beat of each verse. Think fast, my heart rate starts to rise. Stand still, my mind getting paralyzed. All right. Now let's look at these things over here. Uh, this is probably another verse again. Let's find out. Slow down, we're moving in the same space. Yeah, that's just a verse again. Let's see if this gives us any clues. Take me or leave me. Take me or leave me. Yeah, this is definitely the lead in and this is the strong beat. Listen, take me or leave me. This really strong emphasis right on the downbeat of Bar number 42. Take me or leave me. That's a dead giveaway right there. That is, that is, you would never throw that out in the middle of a bar. That's, that's a downbeat emphasis. That's like a crescendo of a chorus, right? Um, and I think we have the same thing over here somewhere. Let's listen to this. 
Take me or leave me. Now it wasn't as strong there, but this was a dead giveaway. Take me or leave me. Yeah, that really strong emphasis right on the downbeat of 42 pretty much makes me confident as a musician, not just a producer, that this is the right offset for this thing. So let's look at what we got here. Um, we got an eight bar intro, and then we're starting the verse on bar nine, and then we're going in these eight bar sections, and everything's hunky-dory, and we've got a little bit of a lead in before bar number nine, and this is the right offset for this stem. And I want you to notice whoever whoever engineered and printed the stems for this soundtrack, they did not print the entire, you know, there might have been an 8-bar intro here, a 16-bar intro. I don't know what the original song was. I wish engineers would just give me the whole stem right from bar one to make this process a lot easier, because then you don't have to do all this stuff I just took you through to figure it out. Almost certainly, the song does not start right on bar one. Slow down like this. God damn it. <laughs> Think fast, my heart. That's not how the song goes. That's not how the singer sung it. She didn't sing against a song structured like this. I guarantee you there was at least an eight bar intro, maybe a four bar intro. And she decided to have a little bit of a lead in syllable here. And that's the strong syllable. So you can't trust where the stem starts. It's never accurate, or it's rarely accurate. You have to figure it out, and you do it against a drum beat. Okay, so we've done this one. We're gonna go through the same exercise for this other stem, and then we'll come back and we'll, we'll go around and talk about how to adjust things that might sound a little off inside of each stem. But the first thing you always have to do is figure out what is the exact tempo of the entire stem, and then you need to figure out what's the offset. Where does, where does the downbeat of the first thing in the stem actually truly start, right? And then, and only then, should you start going in here and chopping it up and adjusting and stretching individual syllables that you feel might need to be tighter onto the grid and not quite as loose the way a singer would sing it. And the last thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna come over here and drag this over to uh, the very end of the interior audio event. And now this clip's ready to go, I could start working on the details of this clip. But let's go through the same exercise one more time because this is I know this is going to be really confusing and unusual for some of you. We're going to go through the same steps again. First, I'm going to look at it. I'm going to turn off uh, everything to do with the drums. I'll do that by just soloing the vocal track. And we're just going to look at the structure. So clearly, this is a phrase, a phrase, a phrase. And then that pattern repeats, short, short, long, short, short, long. And then this starts looking a little different. So these are probably two verses. And looking at the way that this is set up right now, I'm guessing this is probably a four bar verse, followed by another four bar verse. And then we're leading into something different because the structure looks a little different here. So the first thing I'm gonna do, it's often really helpful to just drag your clip over right to the nine of your, of your song. So we're gonna put it right on beat number nine. And just pretend you have at least an eight bar intro with no singing. And that helps you start thinking about where the actual downbeat note might actually sit. Now, if I zoom in here, let's make this track smaller so we're not distracted by it anymore. If we look at the blobs in this verse, this is a strongly loud blob, another loud blob, another loud blob. So chances are good. These are lining up with strong beats. These, these two blobs or maybe these two blobs, right? One of these is a strong beat. Like I said, singers have a tendency to have some sort of lead in syllable. So my guess is that this loudest first bump is probably the downbeat of a new song section. It's the downbeat of the first verse in the song. So I'm gonna get this really close to the 9.1 mark, and I'm gonna consider this to be a lead-in note for just right now. 
Okay, so that's step number one. So if I think that this is a four bar pattern followed by another four bar pattern, what I would expect to see is this little blob right here being the start of the next verse. And I would expect it to be sitting somewhere after the 17 mark. Uh, it's four bar and four bar? Maybe it's eight bar and eight bar. No, right, because I'm starting at, at bar nine. So four bars to 13, another four bars to 17, and then this would be starting another section. So I think what I want to do is start by stretching this little blip right here, right up to the 17 mark so that I'm filling up the first eight bars with just this four bar chunk and this four bar chunk, right? Phrase, phrase. Now, I haven't even heard it yet. I'm just looking at it. Again, this is because I've DJed enough. I can look at a waveform and tell what's going on. Let's listen to it. Saw you standing there, highway broken down. Thought I'd pull over and help you out. Halfway nowhere, what you doing here? In these silent hills all by yourself I know this feeling We could fly together Right, so yeah, this is definitely a four-bar phrase Four-bar phrase, this is a verse And then she's going into a Like a pre-chorus type sound, right? Pre-drop First verse, pre-drop So let's look at this blip which is the third, the start of the third little song section. And we're going to push it out past 17 and start experimenting from there. So I'm going to go down to my tempo marker. And actually, let's, remembering things I showed you in the earlier clips in the video, we're just going to make a lot of room in the clip for this thing to stretch out further towards this end. So this is the... Uh, one, two, th let me zoom into the same level so I'm not confusing you too much. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and this should be starting on the nine or over here at 17 because I'm starting the whole thing at nine. So let's take this and just start pushing it out until this thing is right around 17. And now let's see how things are starting to line up. If I zoom in a little closer, um, and let's take this over one more so that it's actually landing on a quarter note, right? Kick, snare, kick, snare. You almost always, these stem things will almost always be starting on a quarter note somewhere. And the real question is, how far, how big is that lead in? So we can see that this is falling pretty much right on the downbeat of the nine. And here's the first four bar phrase. The second four bar phrase should be starting around the downbeat of 13, but it's early, right? And then this thing should be starting somewhere around 17. And it's still a little early, so I think I didn't stretch it quite far enough yet because I, I want these first two verses that are exactly the same are our real clues. This should be falling somewhere at the same distance after 13 or on 13 as this one. Like if I think this is a down, a strong beat right here, this little blob, that little blob should be sitting on the 13. So let's push it out a little more. Shift, I'm gonna push it until that thing's sitting on the 13. And what am I at, 134, that's sitting on the 13. 134 is an odd sounding tempo, so I'm not sure I'm there yet. This one is closer, the, the 9.1 is a little closer to the start of this blob because pu I'm pushing it out in this direction. So that's good. I'm definitely trending in the right direction. So here's four bars, 13's here, four bars. This thing is clearly hitting somewhere after the downbeat of um, this next four bar section. It's doing that same trick we saw in the other vocal where she lets the kick do its thing and then give a little space and then come in with the first vocals for clarity. Um, 
let's hear what this sounds like. And we're going to skip the metronome this time. We're going to go straight to the drum beat and listen to this against the drum beat and see if it feels like it's keeping up with the drum beat or starting to drag or slow relative to the drum beat. Let's start it here on a, a bar ahead of time so we can feel the lead in or the pickup note. Uh, let's unsolo this. Saw you standing there, highway broken down. Thought I'd pull over and help you out. Halfway nowhere, what you doing here? In these silent hills all by yourself. Okay, so it's close. I can feel that it's close, especially this first one sounds like it's right on, but you notice by the time we got over to here, the vocals were starting to rush the drum beat a little bit. They're faster than the drum beat. And again, DJs will hear that in an instant. If you're not a DJ, if you've never DJed, you might have trouble feeling that this is rushing the beat, but listen closely. In these silent hills all by yourself, I know this feel. Right, this is just, she's ahead of the drum beat. So let's push this out one more semi, one more uh, tempo movement from 134 to 135. And let's go in and look a little closer. And now that's pretty much right where we want to see it. Now remember, Singers are human, they're not machines, so they're never going to be precisely on the beat. But uh, this is looking pretty good, this is looking good. This one is coming in on the snare, on the backbeat. Uh, I'm thinking this is probably the right tempo. Let's um, hear it from the beginning of bar eight. Saw you standing there, highway broken down. Thought I'd pull over and help you out Halfway nowhere What you doing here In these silent hills all by yourself I know this feeling We could fly Now this sounds a little weird. Everything was great all through here. This sounds a little weird, but you have to understand, this, this singer clearly has some chops, and she, she clearly has control over her ability to rush and drag against the beat. And especially when there's a lot of things, a lot of melodic and rhythmic things going on, um, the beat can be really reinforced, and the singer can do crazy games against the beat. And if she only does it for a little bit, it's like jazz players going outside of the harmonic structure for a minute and getting really dissonant and then pulling back into resolution. So I'm not too worried about this yet. It sounds funky. We're going to investigate it, but I'm going to kind of ignore that section and keep going and see if things pull back into feeling like they're on the beat again. Let's see if she just went a little bit outside with her timing. We could fly together. Here go my hopes up through the stormy weather. I've had the same dream, making the same calls, yeah. Seems like insanity. Okay, that's another loose section there. That could just be a mistake on her part. It could have been intentional. I don't know. But everything from that point I started again, everything right up to here sounded good. So this is a waveform I'll use to show you about internal adjustments, because as a producer, I would want to make some creative choices to correct her timing a little bit. Even though maybe what she's doing in all these places I stop were intentional on her part and were part of her creative vision, my creative vision might differ, so I might want to stretch some of these back a little bit tighter into the grid, right? That's a very valid thing to do. So I think there's a little burble here. Uh, I might even put a marker here so that I remember this spot. Wait, uh, this project's not set up to do track markers, is it? There we go. Let's put it right about, where did I hear it? Yeah. Seems like insanity Send myself up to 
All right, well, with summer around here, I'll just leave this here to find it again later. So from here... All right, this is a really important clue right here. Listen to what she's doing in this long, breathy phrase. Ooh, 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 ooh. She's got three very accented syllables in there. You can kind of see them right here and here. And um, definitely there was a strong one right around the downbeat. Listen to it again. kick, right? She's clearly accenting the kicks with her with her breath. Do 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 do, right? That's a really big clue to me that this is probably the right offset for this stem because it would sound a little unnatural. Uh, listen to it one more time. That first ooh, 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 that ooh, that really strong emphasis right here is falling right on the downbeat of a bar. And again, when the singer is feeling the crescendo of a, of a chorus and they're trying to get really emotional and really, really like pump up the energy with the band and get the, get the listener grabbed and just show how much energy and emotion is going on. Their biggest bust out moves when they when they pull their head away from the microphone on stage because they're singing so loud at that moment, almost always will happen on the first downbeat of a bar, not on the second downbeat of a bar, in the middle of a bar. So this loudest ooh, 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 really clearly tells me this is the right spot for that big loud ooh. Hit kick, 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 downbeat, second downbeat, downbeat, right? It just flows. It's perfect. It's perfect. So I'm almost, I'm positive that this is the right offset for the song at this point. And everything's really on beat and is grooving against the bounce of the downbeat and backbeat, the kick and the snare. Let's keep going. I'll start on bar 40. I'm trying to learn from all of these mistakes. I'm trying to lock my heart before I break. No matter all the twists and turns we make, still the same thing. It's the same thing. Oh, so look me in the eyes and say out loud. Cause life is short and we ain't got no plow Don't set me up cause you feeling too proud It's the same thing, still the same thing, yeah Right, now we're getting into outro material um, But this looks totally right on This is This is how things sit So I'm confident that our guess was right. And so one thing I, I hope you're seeing here is most singers will have a pickup syllable or two before the first syllable that they really start accenting in, a, in the first verse of the whole stem. And that first accented thing is usually what falls on a real downbeat, like moving out of the intro in, an eight bar intro section into the eight bar verse section. You got to have an eye and an ear for that first highly accented syllable. And like 80% of the time, you're going to end up with something like this, where there's a short pickup line and the real start of the bar is somewhere inside after the first couple blobs you see, right? First blob or two blobs. Could be a breath. It could be, you know, because the English language, at least for English singers, 
a lot of times singers will stress, uh, it depends on the word, but a lot of times we'll stress the second syllable of a word, right? Um, da -da 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 -da, you know, I gotta go to the something, you know, right? You're gonna stress the second word or you're gonna stress the second syllable of a word or something like that. So this is a clue. Always think about this. Always start somewhere around the nine and push this back and forth by one beat at a time. Look at the blobs. Listen to the blob without a drum beat. Ask yourself and even look for the, the bigness, the largeness of the waveform that indicates they're accenting it more with more power. And just, f you gotta figure out which one of them is the true downbeat. And you also have to make sure you've got the right tempo. And then once you've got these things lined up like this, you're ready to start doing your surgical editing. So this one was mostly on, on time the whole way through. I, I wouldn't want to change anything here. I'd want to let it stay humanized. You really don't want to over-quantize a, an a cappella. You want to let it be very humanized. Let some things be in front of the beat. Let some things be behind the beat. Let the singer rush. Let the singer drag. And it's only when it's really out, really outside, that you want to clean it up. So I heard more outside sections in this second green one. So we're going to use this as our example of what to do once you get to this point. So let's go find this phrase. Let's see, here was the first phrase, first four bars, second four bars, and then this was the part that had something that felt a little outside right here. So let's listen to this from the beginning, start on bar eight to get the right feel of the drum beat. Saw you standing there, highway broken down, thought I'd pull over and help you out. Halfway nowhere, what you doing here? In these silent hills all by yourself I know this feeling Okay, it's right here. Um, so we're going to click here, which syncs me up here in the same spot. So I'm seeing this is the problem area down here. We're going to fix this. Uh, I appreciate it for its outsideness, but depending on the song, I might want to tighten it up against the beat. So we're going to look at this phrase and we're going to fix this phrase and stretch it to be closer, tighter to the beat. So <clears throat> the first thing I want you to understand is you never, ever, 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 ever want to do your surgical tempo changes inside the main stem. Because the minute you start dropping stretch markers in here anywhere, like if I start dropping a stretch marker in here and stretching things back and forth, I'm not just stretching this part of the waveform, I'm stretching everything over here and I'm stretching everything over here and everything's gonna start falling off the beat. And we don't want that, right? So rule number one is visualize where your sections are. We're gonna fix this section. And so you just zoom in a little bit. You find the silence on either side of that section and you just make a, a selection into the silence on either side of that. And then clip it out, control E to clip. And then we're going to highlight, make sure this clip's selected and we're gonna bounce. So control B to bounce. You always want to bounce pre-fader, 32-bit float with no dithering on. This should be your default bounce because this is completely neutral and will never clip and will, you'll never have to worry about dithering. Just always bounce like this when you're bouncing in a project. So we're going to make a new bounce, put it on new track. I'm going to give this track a slightly different color to make it stand out. And then I'm going to take this original clip and deactivate it, which... They never really give us the option on the right click, do they? I have a shortcut key to do it. Um, is there anything over here that deactivates it? No. Is there anything here that deactivates it? Uh, you just have to know. You should. <laughs> Let me make sure you've got this, because you may or may not have this. Uh, if you go to shortcuts and you search for deactivate, under the editing menu, deactivate. Oh God, they changed the name of it, didn't they? Let's go find it a different way. Zero. 
it used to be called deactivate. Now they call it toggle active. Okay, so it's under editing and it's toggle active. You need to find this shortcut and map a key you're gonna remember to it. I use zero because that's what it was in Ableton and my muscle memory from Ableton, I tried to reuse that as much as possible when I moved to Bitwig. So for me, zero always means turn a clip off, mute it, turn everything off, turn a device off, turn a VST off, turn anything off, right? So make sure you've got toggle active mapped to some shortcut that makes sense to you. So I bounced the clip and now I'm gonna deactivate this clip by tapping zero. Then I'm going to put both of these tracks into a group by selecting both of them and doing Control G. And now they're in a group. And I'm going to call this my acapella. Right? So let's kind of look at this from a big picture perspective. All the processing you're going to want to do on this vocal stem, you're now going to want to do in this group lane. This is where you do all your vocal processing. You're going to leave these dry. You're not going to put any processing in this original track where the stem is, and you're not going to put it in any track where you've bounced out a little clip that you're going to do some operating on. This is just for timing and warping. All of these new tracks we make in this group are just for timing and warping and stretching and cleaning up and surgery. Your actual vocal clip from your perspective of the project is just this entire group. And so once you're done doing your surgery on this stem and getting everything stretched and warped and placed and so it's, it's timing feels good to you from start to finish, then you're just going to collapse this group and forget about all those clips inside of it. And this is effectively your, your vocal track from that point forward. And you're going to put all your EQs and compressors and... Um, saturators and feedback and whatever you want to do down here in the processing chain for the entire group, okay? So that's where we're going with this. So what we've done is we popped out this clip, it'll play the original one, then it's empty and deactivated here, so instead we'll hear this one. And as we go along, we're probably going to make one or two more audio tracks inside this group. So we've got this clip. Um, let's just double click it. And we want to see what's going on in here that feels a little bit out of time. And we're gonna we've we're gonna zoom in a little bit so we can see the start of bar 17 right there. You always want to test from the downbeat of a bar in front of the vocal so that your brain hears the drum beat and can feel where things should be hitting against the drum beat. So we're gonna watch this waveform while the drums are playing, and we're gonna figure out what feels, which of these blobs feel a little bit off. I know this feeling. Okay, so this feeling, they feel pretty much in time. This is clearly wanting to hit. Um, I know this feeling. Feeling, snare kick, right? This one here, could probably be a little closer to the snare hit on 17.4. Feeling. And this one's pretty close to the kick, so by the time we get here, we're in good shape. I know this feeling. Oh, and let me show you a trick. This is annoying when this clip moves down here. When you're really zoomed in, working on a small surgical section, go over here and turn off the uh, follow playback button right here. And then it'll stay put. I know this feeling. So, I know this feeling. We could fly together. Yeah, pretty much everything from here to here feels on the beat, close enough to the beat for a humanized performance. It's just this section I want to change the timing of a little bit. So let's pay attention to where this feels off. I know this feeling. I know this feel. I think what I'm going to do is there's an onset right here. I'm going to go into stretch mode and let's get rid of all that highlighting. I'm just going to let this snap to the onset and click it and drag. Actually, wait, I want to make sure none of this other stuff moves. So first I'm going to grab this onset 
and put a stretch marker there to lock this part of the waveform down. And then now if I drag this, see how it only drags those first few blobs, but it leaves all the rest of this alone? That's what I want. So we're just going to take this over one blip to the right from where it originally was. I know this feeling. Uh, that doesn't sound right. Let's go this way. I know this feeling. Let's even go a little further this way. I know this feeling. Mm. What I'm trying to do is split the difference a little bit. Oh god, I'm grabbing the whole clip, aren't I? Hate when that happens. All right. <laughs> Let's get. Ugh. You dastardly dastard, you. All right, I'm going to select that marker and get rid of it. That's the problem when you're... All right, let's just zoom way in and get to it that way. We need to get this back at the start of the clip. And then... What I'm trying to do visually is kind of split the difference between this blob and this blob. And... Get this one close to the snare, the strong beat of the snare, and get this one kind of close to the kick over here. I'm trying to split the difference so they're they're kind of evenly. Um, uh, zoom in a little closer. Let's get you way over. Oh come on, really? That's annoying as hell. Stop. Oh, because I had it highlighted. My bad. All right, now it's independent again. Sometimes those colors matter. <laughs> I had both of them selected at one point. So let's zoom in again to about here. And let's just visually split that difference and get, I'm gonna hold shift so I'm not snapping to the grid. And I'm just kind of putting this blob as close as possible to the kick and this blob as close as possible to the snare. Let's see what it sounds like now. I know this feeling. I know this feeling. That sounds pretty good. Let's also test what happens if I keep going further in this way and just line this one blob up. I know this feeling. That sounds better. This seems to be the one that wants to emphasize with the beat to make this feel less rushed at the beginning. I know this feeling, we could fly together. So let's hear it in the context of the whole track now. Let's start from about here. In these silent hills all by yourself, I know this feeling. Now, that still feels too early to me. So let's try. Let's try removing, no, I like that one. Let's bring it in a little more. I really feel like this whole thing wants to start here, but that's gonna feel too fast because that stretch is way too fast. Check this out, this won't sound right. I know this feeling. See, that's not gonna work. So I think I'm going to have to let this one slide a little bit too. I'm going to select that beat marker and delete it, or stretch marker, beat marker from Ableton Days. I think what I'm going to do is hold this one down, put a new stretch marker there to, to lock this stuff down and keep it from moving. And now I'm going to try shifting this just a little bit more to about there. Let's see what that sounds like. I know this feeling we could... Nope, I don't like that. I know this feeling, we could fly. Yeah, it really sounds best to get this blob right here, pretty much on top of the snare. So let's try this. I know this feeling, we could fly. That's probably okay. Let's try it from this point of the... Of the... In these silent hills all by yourself. I know this feeling. We could fly together. Okay, so at this point you have to ask yourself, did we improve anything, right? Maybe yes, maybe no. 
let's do this. What we're going to do to test whether we actually improved it is highlight both of these stretch markers and just delete them because we can undo that by doing Control Z and put them right back, okay? And then we can redo it by doing Control Y. So I can just go back and forth with Control Z and Control Y, and we can see if there's any really noticeable difference. Did I really help this clip any, or do we just have to live with this, or do we have to try something else? So let's try it without those stretch markers. In these silent hills all by yourself, I know this feeling. See, that, that first thing just feels too rushed. I really want it to start more like here, okay? Um, so let's put the markers back with Control-Z. In these silent hills all by yourself I know this feeling we could fly Let's try this. I'm going to put an onset, a marker right here with this onset. And let's take this over just a tinch again, just a little bit later. But now I'm kind of locking it down starting here. In these silent hills all by yourself, I know this feeling. Gotta give, it's gotta give. Oh, I didn't mean to put that there. Let's see. In these silent hills all by yourself, I know this feeling we could fly to. Nope, in this case, I don't think there's a way to really easily, truly easily fix that. Everything I'm trying either doesn't make it significantly better or in these silent hills. Let's listen to it from here. I know this feeling. I know this feeling. We. I know this feeling. I know this feeling. We could fly together. Let's try this. I'm going to put a stretch marker here. And let's try squeezing all of this up just a teeny bit and see what happens. I'll put another marker here. Start dragging it in just a little bit. I know this feeling. We could f I know. See, now that feels rushed, but how does it feel when we start In these over silent here? hills all by yourself I know this feeling we could fly No, I can't make it better. Everything I'm going to do is just a little bit off, and it's just not worth changing it. So we're going to undo this, and we're going to uh, let that live. Uh, I don't want to give up. I still feel like something's a little off. What if I drag this one over to here? Let's see what happens. In these silent hills all by yourself I know this feeling we could fly to Maybe. Let's bring this one back over here. In these silent hills all by yourself I know this feeling we could fly to get that needs to be more like here. in these silent hills all by yourself I know this feeling we could fly to I feel like this should be more like in here. these silent hills all by yourself I know this feeling we could fly to Really, nothing I'm doing is making it In better. these silent hills all by yourself I know this feeling we could fly In these silent hills all by yourself I know this feeling we could fly Nope.
we're just going to walk away from this one. So this is part of the process. You hear a thing, you're not sure about it. You could choose to cut this out. You could choose to just not include this first kind of rushed part, but there's not really much point having this separate clip anymore. In these silent hills all by yourself I know this feeling we could fly together Let's try one more thing. I'm just going to tighten this one up to the beat here. In these silent hills all by yourself I know this feeling we could fly together that actually might be better let's control z in these silent hills all by yourself i know this feeling we could fly control y in these silent hills all by yourself i know this feeling we could fly now that actually, to me, sounds like an improvement, timing-wise. We tighten, this is clearly something that wants to happen on a beat. And then this is bringing this little um, slightly stronger thing closer to the downbeat of 18.1. It's tightening this up, it's tightening this up, it's tightening this up, right? Just by dragging this over one uh, quarter note, one, uh, I'm sorry, 16th note, <laughs> right? I still feel like this is a little rushed, but I'm not sure how much I can push it. Let's let's take this and just stick it back over one sixteenth note in this direction and try one in more time. In these silent hills all by yourself, I know this feeling. Nah, that doesn't sound good. Let's take it back here and let's actually stretch it closer to the strong beat. At 17.2, where the snare is hitting. Let's get this blob closer to the snare. In these silent hills all by yourself, I know this feeling we. Okay, that actually works. In these silent hills all by yourself, I know this feeling we could fly. And we could even try a trick. Let's drag this one back out again extend this but pull this back closer to 17.3 again just a little bit in these silent hills all by yourself i know this feeling now then this feels too cramped in here it's not flowing right so we're going to undo that move in these silent hills all by yourself i know this feeling we could fly and let's even try taking this just a little closer so that really the the main weight of the blob is over this line and the main weight of the blob is in over this line. In these silent hills all by yourself I know this feeling I liked it better before, so we're going to undo to there. So I think this is an improvement, and again, let's test that it's an improvement. I'm going to use my get my cursor where it needs to be to highlight just that one and control click this one. So I've only got those two selected and now I'm going to delete them. But if I do undo, they'll come back, right? And if I do redo with control Y, I'll delete them again. So now I can toggle back and forth. So let's hear the In original. These silent hills all by yourself. I know this feeling. Versus. In these silent hills all by yourself I know this feeling we could fly Let's do it again In these silent hills all by yourself I know this feeling In these silent hills all by yourself I know this feeling we could fly together yeah i still think i need to deselect that one we're gonna leave that one where it is but i'm gonna bring this one back here again in these silent hills all by yourself i know this feeling we could 
I actually like this best. From a creative standpoint, this is the, the compromise that works best for me. I think it's better than the original. It, it feels a little less rushed. Um, you could make a creative choice that it sounded just fine the way it is before. This is where it just falls onto producer's ears. Uh, I, I might sweat this one and come back and check it over a couple days and really let my head reset. But for the purpose of this video, let's just pretend that's a good choice, right? Now we heard another problem somewhere around here. Let's find it again. Weather, I've had the same dream Making the same calls, yeah Seems like insanity Send myself up to fall Was it here? So, through the stormy weather I've had the same dream Making the same calls, yeah Seems like insanity Send myself up to fall No, all that sounds good. Is it over here? Uh, there was something that sounded a little off to me the first time. Here go my hopes up through the stormy weather. I think it was here. Here go my hopes up through the stormy. Yeah, this feels a little rushed right here. Right here. So let's move this marker over here. Just to remember where it's hiding. Okay, so let's do the same thing here. We're gonna take this phrase and find a way to chop it out cleanly at absolute silence on either side. Control E, Control B, Enter. Now we have a new bounce. Let's make this yet another color. Uh, and let's come over here and deactivate this one. So we're gonna work on this one now. So as something right here is a little bit off sounding. Double click, get in here. And we have the start of a bar here, so that's good. Here go my hopes up. Here go my hopes up through the storm. It's this through this right here. Here go my hopes up through the storm. This feels rushed. This really feels like it needs to be sitting on this backbeat snare right here. So what I'm going to do is the trick where we... Here go my hopes up through the storm. This one's fine. So I want to lock this one down and make sure it doesn't move. So I'm going to put a stretch marker there. And everything from here onward, we're going to leave alone. I just want to push this over this way a little bit. Uh, and I don't want to change the timing of any of these either. So I'm going to put a stretch marker there. And now I can play a little more freely with things in here and see what happens. I'm going to line this blob up over the kick, get the meat of this on top of the kick. And I'm going to get this one closer to um, the snare. Now to do that, actually, I probably need to get rid of this stretch marker and instead lock it down somewhere around here. I'm going to manually put in a stretch marker here and I'll let this crunch up just a little bit. So let's grab and put a stretch marker right here. And see, I'm not even using the onsets anymore. I'm just looking at the waveform. I'm going to drag this over to about there. And let's see what that sounds like now. Here go my hopes up through the stormy weather. That already sounds better. Let me undo. Here go my hopes up through the stormy. See, that feels a little rushed on these two syllables here. Through this feels rushed. But if I... Uh, undo it. Here go my hopes up through the stormy. 
So this sounds better, moving this blob onto the beat at the snare beat right here. I could even move it just a tinch farther with a shift to get it off the grid. Gonna center it on there. And then I'm gonna take this one, I'm gonna put another stretch mark right here by double clicking and then drag this one back a little bit to get it kind of where it was before. And see, it's taking this one with it because I've got both of them selected, so that isn't what I want. So I'm gonna go way over here and do Control-Z to undo. And then I just need to make sure this one isn't highlighted too. So I'm gonna click away from them, come back here, and now drag this back over just a tinch this way. Hold down Shift to let me fine tune it, get it about like that. Let's see how this sounds. There go my hopes up. Through the stormy weather Here go my hopes up Through the stormy weather I think I'm also going to take this one and put a stretch marker here and get rid of this stretch marker yeah, and not let this pop out a little closer to this line because I feel like this wanted to hit about here. Here go my hopes up through the stormy weather. I could even take this and put another stretch marker right here and then just... Again, let's lock things down over here. I'm gonna put another stretch marker so that I'm only stretching this little segment in between. I'm gonna hold down shift and I just wanna nudge it just a tinch this way, just a very small tinch. Here go my hopes up through the stormy weather. That sounds tight. Here go my hopes up through the stormy weather. Now here I'm gonna let you hear the before and after by just um, muting or deactivating the clip we've done all that surgical warping on, let you hear the original again. So we're going to unmute that. So here it is from this point in time. Here go my hopes up through the stormy. Hear how it's rushed? Versus. Here go my hopes up through the stormy weather. I've had the same dream. Okay, so I think that's an improvement. Again, creative choice, preferences, all that good stuff, but we'll just pretend that's what I want to do because it's my song and I'm using this acapella in my song. So I've taken you through this process of making two surgical fixes to things that I thought the timing was a little loose on and I wanted to tighten up or improve in some way. The rest of the clip is completely untouched. I haven't done any surgical stretching up in this green clip. I do it in little bounces from the original clip and you just mute the other clips. And this is, if you think about it, this is a lot like the technique of vocal comping where you, you do like five takes in a row and you pick the best little chunks out of each one and you just, they're the only ones that are active in any given slice of time on the arranger. And then they're all just rolling up into one sort of master track where which you think of as your actual vocals, right? And this is just little bits and pieces that make up the master track. And that's effectively all we've done here. And now this is my vocal track, start to finish. So there's all my best tips for dealing with acapellas. Thank you so much for hanging with me. Um, hope this has been helpful and I'll see you next.